extremely talented, and, and that's going to be a huge challenge for our program. And, uh, you know, we've obviously started to dive into them as, as that being our opener, like we would with anybody. But um, yeah, they're a talented team, and we're going to have to step up to a huge challenge. For them. And it's not someone you're unfamiliar with from your time at Wake Forest at Texas A&M. Yep. Yeah. So I, we played Dabo five times, and so um, you know we haven't won yet. So that's that's not a good sign. But um, no, I, you know I think obviously with the new offensive coordinator, the system has changed, and um, I think there's been subtle changes to the defense with Brett leaving. But um, you know Clemson has, has been a very successful program for a very long time, and so uh, hopefully the familiarity helps a little bit. Riley said over there that you know this year. Last year at this time, he wasn't even sure he could play a snap for Duke. When did it become obvious to you that, that you had something at, at the quarterback position? Yeah, we noticed probably within the first week of practice in fall camp that he was there. You know, coming out of the spring, it was an open competition, and we didn't really feel like anybody had kind of stepped up. And, and I think within the first five, six practices, we realized that we had gotten a lot better and made a huge jump over the summer. And that's when we started talking about, you know, the Jordan Moore transition to wide receiver. Um, you know, and then it was just, could he sustain it? Could he continue? Could he continue to be consistent? Uh, and then I think what I, I told a lot of people this, what you didn't know, though, was how gritty he was how much moxie we had, and that started to jump out really quick when we started playing some other people, and so uh, at that point, we kind of knew we had something pretty special. Talking about the quarterback position a little bit, you have a freshman that came in in January, Grayson Loftus. Yeah. He had a nice spring game. What did you see out of him, and what are the plans for him this year? Is there a chance he red shirts, or is he going to be in the mix to be a backup uh, somewhere in the line? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think he's, he's a really mature kid. He's been playing quarterback a really long time, and you know, obviously anytime there's a high school senior running around your college campus, um, that's a huge challenge, and then even more so when you're at the quarterback position. And so you know, we're really excited with Grayson. We're excited with who he is and where he is in the future. Um, he's going to come into fall camp and compete to be uh, the backup and, and see what happens. But, um, you know, we're just really excited for him in his future. Mike, what does the contract extension say about Duke's commitment to you and the program and then Brett back on the other side, your commitment to staying here and building something at Duke? Yeah, I think it shows commitment on both sides, and I think it was a huge step um, for us, and, and thank you again to Vince Price and Nina King for what they did, um, not only committing to me, but really committing more to our staff uh, and our entire program. And I think that was something that we really wanted to get done, was just to show how committed Duke was to being successful on the football field. And, and that was a big step. And then, obviously, I've been saying it since I got here, nobody wants to listen, but um, I chose Duke for a reason. I, I think I connect really well with the university, with the message, with what we stand for, and, and what our program is all about. And so my family's really happy there, we're really happy there, and I'm just glad this is kind of over with. You kept saying elevate out there, I noticed that word. You know, what, is, what, is that like a buzzword? work for you right now what does that mean for you yeah i just think you know there's only so much you can become in year one you know everything you do in year one is broad stroke because there's just so much to get done and so much to accomplish and so when you start talking about year two it's taking those details and just elevating your game and that's so yeah it's been a buzzword for us all off season you know we know the schedule is more challenging. We know we have a lot of players back, and what we need to do is we need to continue to elevate who we are and, and grow our game so that we can make uh, rise up to the challenges that are going to come at us as well. What kind of progress have you Um, sarcasm <laughs> is probably the, the best tool I use. No, like, Riley's a great kid, and and he really doesn't need a lot of help. But I think him and I just have a lot of conversations about. Um, how to play the game the right way. I think one of the things that I try to get him to understand and, and is how important the quarterback position is. And so um, not that he needs a reminder of that, but just every play you make could be the one that impacts the game, right or wrong. And so we try to drill, drill that message into him every day in practice. And so, um, no, he, he doesn't need a lot of help from me, but um, we just try to make sure he stays grounded and, and keeps working. What kind of have you seen from Jayden? Yeah, I think he's continuing to develop and continue to work. And, you know, he's a kid that, that, you know, we'll see what he looks like in fall camp and hopefully he can carve a niche out for himself. He's got the Given your varied experience in Ivy League, SEC, how important is that to the Souls? Can you ever have two? Uh, I mean, the commitment of resources is what you need, and I think that's been my goal since I started down this process with Duke 18 months ago was trying to enhance 
what we could do first and foremost for the student athletes. You know, we've talked a lot about the priority in the transfer portal is building a program that players want to be part of and trying to keep kids in your program and not out of the transfer portal. And that comes with resources. And then how you build out a staff and, and not only a quality staff, but also there's a quantity piece of that nowadays that really matters and how you can affect kids in every aspect of their life from mental health to nutrition to sports psychology and adding those pieces um, to truly go out and, and tell parents, listen, we are running an elite Power Five program that matches resources at the highest level. And then it's just continuing to pour into those um, foundations to allow it to continue to grow and, and, and develop. And I think that's what this commitment shows. And obviously, it's the administrators that are really Yeah, you know, I, I heard Jim say this yesterday, and I think he's right. I think sometimes we get caught up in more is always better. We just want to make sure we have enough. And I think that's something even at Duke that is, is really critical. It's not necessarily that we need to have the absolute top amount of resources. We just need to have enough resources to provide what is a quality elite experience for our student athletes. And I think we're moving in that direction. When, when you mentioned Elevate before, with all the returning starters you have, your message to the team this year is that, you know, it's like, you bet, I expect us to Elevate because we have all this experience, but if they make the most of it, or do you look at it like, oh no, I mean, it's going to be different, and you think it's a super good building on yeah, that, that was the message in February was every year is different, you know, and, and no different than we were a three and nine team that became a nine and four team and three and nine had nothing to do with nine and four. You know, nine and four is going to have nothing to do with how this season plays out. And I think our kids really embrace that this offseason. You know, there, there's a price you have to pay for success in college football um, that you got to pay it yearly. And, and you see that like across the board, you know, of, of teams that are off the radar that have really good seasons, teams that get a lot of preseason hype that don't. Um, and, and all of that stuff is getting decided right now behind closed doors um, with work ethic and people doing the things they need to do to give themselves an opportunity to have success. And, and we're doing it. You look around the locker room and go, okay, I know what a winning team feels like, looks like. And I felt the last year, and I used to feel like, okay, I've got the same for me this year. Yeah, I mean, you don't know until you go out in fall camp and you really start practicing. Um, I know we're better. Um, I know we're a bigger, faster, stronger team than we were last year. I know we understand schematically and fundamentally what we're trying to do and what we're trying to execute better. Um, you know, now are we gonna are we gonna really be a team that's willing to lay it all on the line and, and do it, play in and play out over the course of three hours? Um, that's what we build in training camp, and that's what training camp will show us. No, I don't think I don't think any of that stuff provides motivation. We've got in the middle of our program pillars is the word now. And, and that's the most important thing in our program because that's all you can control. And, and that's just the mindset of being where your feet are. And, and I think um, much like, you know, three and nine was something that we had to wash away and just move forward from and impact the now, so too is nine and four. Um, and I just think we're at a place as a program where we focus on today and, and what can we do today to get better and how do we make sure that, that we're doing the things that are going to give us a chance to be successful. And if we do that consistently over time, we will be. Riley has a few suck bracelet that we're laughing about. So does, does he like hard coaching from you? Um, I wouldn't say hard coaching. I think uh, our guys embrace the truth, and, and that's what we try to do with them. And I think um, if they were to tell you anything about me, they would tell you that Coach Elka keeps it very real with us. Um, and so if he makes a bad throw, he made a bad throw, and then we've got to figure out how not to do that. If he makes a bad decision in practice, he made a bad decision in practice. It's not, oh, he's Riley Leonard, he's our starting quarterback. We can't address the fact that he made a bad decision. I just think we try to live in, and ground ourselves in reality, and I do the same as a coach, and we do the same with our staff, and, and that's just growth, right? It, we want to be people who want to get better every day, and sometimes to get where we want to go, we got to hear the areas of our shortcomings so we can figure out how to improve and get better. 
sports gambling is about to be legalized in North Carolina. I know the NCAA has changed some of its rules around it, but is that something you address with your team at all? That, hey, you can't, you can't gamble. I know your friends are gambling, but, but you can't do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something we've addressed for a long time. Uh, I don't know that the teams in North Carolina impacts that. I know NIL kind of put that a little at the center front again just to make sure, like, hey, listen, you're around and interacting now more with people outside of our program. Um, here's one of the huge pitfalls, and obviously sports gambling is one of them, right? And, and the different ways you can get caught into bad situations with that. And so I, I think it's just something we continue to try to educate people on. I'm not sure that legalization in North Carolina makes a huge impact on it, but it's certainly a, a prevalent thing that we've got to address in our program. Coach Elko, I want to think about what he was saying about your nine-win season. I don't want to say you dismissed it, but just like that's last year. I think it coming off the foul win. I think that's impressive. First year at Duke in the ACC and the military bowl victory. Why would you kind of use that as like tell your players, hey, we had nine, we can get off that nine and possibly go to double the ACC? Yeah, because I, I just think there's two avenues that we talk about all the time, right? The nine wins is, is for the program momentum. Right, and, and so there's this marketing piece of our program as we're trying to push what Duke football is capable of to our fan base, to recruits, to people to just get them excited about what Duke football is, right? And to all of those people, we're a nine-win team coming off of a military bowl victory, and here's all of the things that improved within our program that are going to allow that to continue to go in that direction. To the guys in the locker room that got to go out and, and compete opening Monday night against Clemson, it's a different thought process, right? It's, it's what are we going to do to give ourselves the opportunity to repeat that, right? And, and we want to be process driven, not result driven. And so there's a process that goes into winning. And that's something that we focus on. And so to me, like we always talk about, there's two different avenues, right? We're going to push the heck out of nine and four to the entire North Carolina area, the triangle, like everybody, everybody right? Like, listen, we're doing something special at Duke, man. Come be part of it. Like, this is unique. What we're doing, what we can offer, what we can build, the quality of education matched with great athletics, like nobody else is doing that at the level we're doing that, right? But I don't know that any of that helps us win a football game this fall, right? And so we just talked to our own guys a little bit differently. Coach, what's the uh, biggest thing that your defense needs to improve on this season? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest focus is probably our pass defense. I think, you know, we made some strides last year. I think we got better as the year went on. But, um, you know, we're going to play some really talented quarterbacks and some really talented passing attacks this year. And, and for us to have the level of success that we want and need to have, I think that's probably the biggest area of emphasis for us. No, I, I think we've got to let training camp play out. I, I think, um, you know, Terry Moore has an opportunity to fill into that role. I think Brandon Johnson has an opportunity to fill in that role. Isaiah Fisher-Smith has gotten healthy. Um, to see Jungo Sungo has had a really good offseason. And so um, I think it's more about letting fall camp play out. Uh, somewhere around the second scrimmage, um, we'll have a better feel of what the right five to put in that secondary is. Miles Jones yeah, I mean, I, I think the reason why we brought them in was for that. I think they're experienced guys who have, have played a lot of football, and uh, we felt like we needed that. We, we, we were very happy with the guys we were bringing back. We just felt like there was still a gap between the old guys and, and a really young group. And to try to take some of the stress off of those really young kids, we felt like we needed to add some veteran experience into the mix, and we were able to do that. How much more did you get with the running game with yeah, I mean, we'll find out in fall camp. I mean, obviously, it's critical for our success. You know, we want to be a balanced team. We want to be able to run the football. We feel really good that we have every running back coming back and, you know, the majority of our offensive line starters back. And um, But, you know, we've got to go out there and we've got to establish that again this fall. How much more challenging is it, you know, the very important team like Clemson, the new offensive coordinator, the quarterback, and a lot of results? Yeah, I, I think, you know, fortunately, there, there's, you know, 
a lot of familiarity with Cade from my time at Texas A&M, um, and so I, I got to know Cade pretty well as a player um, through that whole process, and, and he was obviously a, a hugely talented kid down there, and so um, some familiarity with him, that helps, it doesn't give me 12 games like I wish I had, but it gives me a little bit, and then, um, you know, obviously a tremendous amount of respect for Garrett and what he's done everywhere he's been, and certainly the year that he had last year, and so there'll be a little bit of a, uh, you know, unknown because you don't know what parts of the package he's going to bring in and really emphasis and focus on at Clemson, and so uh, it creates a little bit of uncertainty, but, um, you know, that's not a lot different than what you deal with in openers, you know, it's nowadays in college football, uh, you know, the fact that they have the same head coach and the D coordinator makes them unique in, in, in this day and age we're living in, right, so um, you just kind of get used to having to figure some of that stuff out and, and give your best guess for it. Along those same lines, you've got so many people back to play a game of that magnitude right out of the gate. How much better is it to have that kind of team to face that rather than be in a situation where you do have a lot of good people to replace? Yeah, I mean, certainly would rather have guys coming back than not. I mean, that's that's for sure. And, and I think, um, you know, with, with everything that's going to go around having a major game in the opener, you want older veteran guys that can handle that. You know, if you've got a lot of first-time starters playing in that game, not really sure what college football is about, and, and their welcome is Clemson opening night Monday, welcome to college football. Like, that's a pretty big jump from where they were as high school players or not having played a lot of ACC football. So, you know, certainly the experience helps, but, you know, they've got a ton too, and, and they're extremely talented. Where do you fit in on the uh, elimination of divisions? How do you... How do you feel about it? Yeah, honestly, I think it's great. I really do. I think the, the opportunity for our kids to get around and play more programs, more teams, more consistently, I think is something that I think everybody's in favor of. Um, you know, obviously, whether it hurts one team one year or not, I think at the end of the day, the fact that all of our kids get two games with Clemson, two games with Miami, two games with Florida State, um, the fact that we play NC State every year now, um, you know, to imagine that a kid could come to Duke and not play NC State in his entire career um, just seems, you know, not right. You know, it's, it's 20 minutes down the road. Um, and so I just think it, it creates more balance in the who's playing who within our conference, which is good. Obviously, you keep playing the lines. You have your team focused on them now. As far as the program goes, what kind of next steps in modernizing team football, as far as facilities and benchmarks? I think you guys are doing some, some work on the player lounge. Yeah, I, I think um, I think we are focused on every aspect of it. I think we um, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis are just looking at, you know, which part of it can elevate. You know, we just did a major renovation to our second floor this offseason. Uh, we feel really good about what we've done from a branding standpoint. Um, we're pushing through some, some more projects that hopefully are going to come online at the end of the season. Um, and I just think, you know, we look at every aspect of our program. Last year it was things as small as meal plan and on-campus housing. And, um, you know, we're trying to build this thing in totality, and that's really important to us. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, I think you just challenge him to, to what he's capable of becoming. And, and it doesn't, the, the great thing about working in our program is it doesn't take a lot. It just takes conversation. You know, I don't have to, like, show him this low-light film of himself. And, like, I just, you just have to have real, honest, open dialogue with these guys. And it's, listen, you know, hey, here's where you were good last year. Here's some of the areas where we were struggling. Here's some of the areas where we need to improve because now there's a whole offseason of tape on you. And defensive coordinators are looking at you. They're studying at you. And you're going to see a lot more of what we weren't good at this season. And so we've got to grow in order to have the same level of success that you want to have and that we had last year. Probably said when you took over that, that your message was win now, I'm going to take this team to win three and nine, and we're going to go win now. What gave you that confidence that you all could go win a meeting? I, I don't know that it was confidence. I just feel like that's what you should do. Like, if, if we're honestly talking about this, like, I took over a locker room of, of 80 kids on scholarship that had poured their heart and soul into Duke football. What they deserve is me to tell them we're going to win now and we're going to do everything we can to be as sex successful as we possibly can now. And, and whether that's a reality or whether that's ultimately how it plays out, 
I don't know, and I certainly didn't know when I said that, but I just felt like that's what those kids deserve. They deserve a coach who was going to give them every opportunity they could to be as successful as they could, as quick as they could. Yeah, I, I think one of the unique things about our defensive package is what we do on third down. It's a little bit more exotic maybe than, than what other teams do. And so um, that's kind of been our calling card as a defensive coordinator for years. And so I think um, third down days get a little bit exciting. And then obviously when you have a, a returning quarterback, you just try to stress him. Uh, as much as you can. You don't ever want him to be comfortable and get in rhythm. And so, you know, even in practice, we try to find ways to make the quarterback uncomfortable because um, that's everybody's goal, right? And so that's certainly what everyone's going to try to do to him this fall. And so we just think that helps prepare him for what's coming. Yeah, I think it does all of this, right? It, it creates a buzz about who we are. It creates a buzz about what we're capable of being. There's storylines being written about Duke football. I think one of the positive big picture things for our program is the amount of talk regarding Duke football uh, this offseason. You know, and a lot of that obviously centers around Riley and what he's done and the success that he had. And can he go out and do it again? And, and anytime you have a player like that, um, there's obviously tremendous value that provides to the program. No, I, I wouldn't say unfinished business. I just think we know we have a tremendous opportunity with the group we have. And I think um, it almost became like a domino effect, right? As, as you know, Jacob decided to come back and Dwayne decided to come back and Jalen Calhoun decided to come back, like all of a sudden it just became like, you know, if we all come back, like this could really create a really unique opportunity. Um, and you only get to do this once, right? You get one time in your life to be a college football player. And, and they all have bigger goals and aspirations beyond Duke football, NFL, life, career, all of it. But this is an opportunity to really just come back together with guys that I care a lot about and do something really special. And that's kind of been our message. How do you go about studying Clemson's like personnel when you've got, I guess you're looking at personnel playing in a different system and now they're kind of moving into to gear while these systems? Yeah, yeah it, it's confusing at times because you're bouncing around between a lot of different teams. You know, you'll be watching SMU and then you're watching uh, TCU and then you're watching Clemson. And, um, but, um, no, I, I think, you know, you can see a kid's skill set a little bit regardless of scheme. Um, and then what you're trying to do is just project – how he may fit into what Garrett does, right? And, and it won't be perfect, but we've got to try to do our best guess at, at trying to figure some of that stuff out. And, and obviously, you know, like most openers, because even us, you know, we're going to have a lot of wrinkles and a lot of things that we do a little bit differently. You know, you go into openers um, ready to adapt on the fly. I think that's just what openers are all about. And so um, this one maybe we'll have a little bit more with our defense than normal. Mike, when you run – your different defenses. How often do you face air raid type teams, air raid concepts? Um, probably a lot over the course of the years. I don't know that I could put it into words. And, and um, you know, and then you just talk about like what actually is the air raid. And so um, you play Mike Leach, and that's a lot different than playing Garrett Riley. And, you know, so there's a lot of different wrinkles and variations to what air raid actually has become. And so. Um, I think the fact that we haven't faced Garrett probably is where the, the lack of knowledge of that specific system comes from, more so than general air raid. What is normally, when it's more of a run-heavy air raid, like how do you prepare for it? I mean, do you, do you use some stuff you've done against heavy run offenses, or do you know they're going to kind of spread you out and try to keep you guessing? I mean, without giving away the opening right. game plan to the guy who works <laughs> for Clemson. Um, no, I'm kidding. No, I, I think... Um, we're, we're, we probably look at it a little differently. This isn't the answer you're looking for, but it's just how we look at it. We're more matchup driven and, and system driven. And so honestly, I, I care more about Will Shipley and Kate Klubnick and, and those types of things and how we're going to leverage players uh, more so than like specific versions of a run heavy area. Um, I just think we're trying to figure out 
um, what they're going to try to do to have success with the players that are having that system, and then what can we do to, to kind of count it on. You mentioned third down packages and how important that is. This will be Jade's second start. I guess just how important is it to try to confuse them some and try to get some pressure on them? Yeah, I, I, regardless of what start it is, that's critical. I, I think, um, you know, we played we played Trevor Lawrence in his second start and had to do the same thing. I played Deshaun Watson in his third year, and we were trying to do the same thing, you know, and, and to some degree you have success and to some degree you don't. Um, I just think, you know, you have to make the quarterback uncomfortable. You have to get them out of rhythm. You have to not allow them to feel really comfortable, and, and you know, maybe that's a little bit, more important for a young kid to try to rattle him than it is for an older kid or maybe a little easier to do at times um, but also have a lot of respect for Cade and the kind of quarterback he is and you know I expect him to come in fully ready to, to play his best football on that Monday night. I guess down the road a little bit but do you know Jeff Brown from a little bit at all or have any dealings with him? No, no he's, he's another guy I mean I met him at ACC media days and, and um you know, he's not a guy that we've played against much, and so um, not a ton of familiarity. And then obviously they're so far down the road that we haven't done a ton in the offseason on them because we get them after. We have a bye week before that game, and so, you know, we have some time down the road to work on that. Um, yeah, I, I think everything that you try to do is, is look in the mirror at, okay, here's what I did last year. Um, how can I get better? You know, I want to get better at managing games. I want to get better uh, at finding time to continue to develop relationships with our players through the season and not allow the time commitments to overwhelm me. Um, I think maybe those two probably being the most prevalent, but there's so many things when you look at your day-to-day -day job of, okay, this is how I did it. I can make this little tweak, I make this subtle difference, um, practice schedule, format, days off, what we're doing, how we're doing it. Um, you just really try to look at everything you do um, and try to do it to the best you can. Thank you guys so much. Coach has to go. Thank you. Sorry guys, thank you. Thanks,